Hi, and welcome to Middle of the Eschatology. As you see, I'm having a little fun here with technology. We have improved and new and improved, I should say. Um, we want to continue on as we have been doing in the past and refuting pray all things preterism um, and showing how uh, all things are not fulfilled according to their paradigm. Uh, we do this to help people who are questioning full preterism um, and, and showing the inconsistencies and the problems of full preterism and exposing uh, their complete, well, I should be nice, but the complete lack of, of theology and everything else that has everything to do with it. So what we want to do today is go through three things. One, John Watson's dealing with a uh, desire to get a, uh, how do you call it, a debate going with jo John Welsh. And he's been pushing this for quite a bit of time here now and uh, doing a lot of videos and, and debating him. And if we've noticed that John Watson wants to do all the debates against uh, other Church of Christ ministers is his goal. Um, and he does whatever tactic he can to, to debate them. Um, of course, they don't want to, John really doesn't want to do too many outside of that and of course he wants to pick targets that are and i don't mean this in a real dis disrespectful way but he chooses to use people that he knows that he can win against um and let's just let's just look at something here on this video from him uh so we haven't heard from john about this he never said he wanted to do this that is not true you did hear from me you did hear from me you did hear from me and it's the exact same thing three years ago nearly as I had to say this time. It, there, nothing has changed. Nothing. Anyway. For, uh, See how they are? Well, I wanted to make the point that I've been asking for a debate with John Watson for a little while now, now too, but he refuses to deal with me. And I think in reality that uh, some predators have to completely dismiss me uh, because they can't really argue against what I am saying. And I will prove that here in this video. Uh, let me go on just here for a second more. Uh, two and a half years. They, they, they know they can't win fair and square. They know they can't win at all. So they have to dodge and duck and run and divert. And, and that's what I'm saying about John. He does all of those things with me. I'm more than willing to face him as a futurist. Anytime I won't duck, cover anything else, but he refuses to actually respond to me um, and attempt to deal with what I want to uh, deal with with him in a debate. And I would love to debate him on the resurrection, uh, the resurrection of the body, uh, physical or the second coming. But more likely, I would love the resurrection of the dead, those two basic things. Um, we don't need to go on any further than that. We can destroy the uh, the full progress paradigm simply through the resurrection of the dead, 1 Corinthians 15 and and uh, these other main passages, and it can be done quite easily uh, at this point in time. Now, getting into the main thing of what uh, we want to talk about today, and this is in response to uh, William Bell, and I do not know if I have this queued up real quick, but we will try this. Um, I want to deal with the eight rules of hermeneutics, and uh, I'll explain why here from one of the points that we made in the study of that lesson was to uh, read the context in context, to read it in its historical setting as opposed to simply, um, you know, just diving into the chapter, reading some verses and then say, saying this applies to me. You know, a lot of Bible studies are conducted in that fashion. You know, people just pick up the Bible and they read a verse out of the Bible and say, what does that mean to you? Right. And everybody gives their opinion about what a particular text means to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you're subject to get any and all kinds of ideas from the text. However, what we were suggesting to you is that when you read the Bible, you know, you read it in its historical context, Prabhu Das, all the way from uh, India. And uh, good to uh, see you on the line. I just kind of lost something. Okay. And it's a historical setting. we got to understand it, and it's a historical setting. Well, I want to go to the rules of Herman Oaks for one quick. And as you can see on the screen there, it is basically the eight rules right here. 
And number four, the rule of historical background. So now he's gonna, gonna deal with the three and most prefaces don't deal with the first three, but they go straight to this one, the rule of historical background. The interpreter must have some awareness of the life and the society of the times in which the scriptures were written. So the spiritual principles will be timeless, but often can't be properly appreciated without some knowledge of the background. So if the interpreter can have in his mind what the writer had in his mind when he wrote it without adding in excess baggage from the interpreter's own cultic or society, then the true thought of the scripture can be captured, resulting in an accurate interpretation. Oliver Wendell Holmes stated, our only interest in the past is for the light it throws upon the present. Another way to state that would be is that uh, they want to define it as audience relevance. So when the Bible told Paul, Paul, um, go to Macedonia, we don't take it as us being the ones that are being told to go to Macedonia. But we understand that the principle of the truth in a teaching of the epistles or from Paul or Peter or James is what we are understanding that we are to apply to our life. And that's what we understand and kind of what he implied. Audience relevance does not mean um, what they quite want it to mean because here's where they take it further. See, if all the scripture talks about the future second coming. It always talks about everything in that sense as in future, because from the perspective of when they wrote it, of course, it is all future. But for them, what they're saying, their future for them was 70 AD, not 2000 years later. But in reality, it doesn't matter if it was 70 AD or 2000 years later. It's still future. It's still written in it. Um, but they want to confine it to that generation. So anything that pertained to the second coming, the resurrection of the dead, or any of those vets whatsoever, are to be understood. The audience realized it was to happen in that generation. So therefore, it has to be happened to them in AD 70. And none of those things can happen in, uh, 2,000 years later. So they want to narrow, define everything to audience relevance relevance to be about 70 AD. Now, our problem is, is there are seven other rules. And the first rule, uh, the rule of definition, what does a word mean? Any student of scripture must define what a word means. Define your terms and then keep the terms defined. The interpreter should be conscientious and abide by the plain meaning of words. This quite often may require using a Hebrew English or English lexicon in order to make sure that the sense of the English translation is understood. A couple of good examples of this are the Greek words elos and heteros. Both are usually transferred as another in English. Now I want to check something here. Okay, we're doing good. Um, yes, elos literally means another same type and heteros also means of another different type. So, you know, we want to understand the words. And so one of the first words, and I wanted to bring this up. Now, I want to talk about uh, my book here for just a second. And this is uh, on, of course, Amazon.com. You can find it there. The full program, The Assault on Orthodox Christianity. And we deal with things straight up all the way across the board and uh, answer a lot of the questions, uh, go through a scenario of what the end times are really supposed to be like, um, and then, of course, why full preterism fails historically as well as uh, logically and, and consistency, even if you try to do it with uh, an AD 70 fulfillment. Uh, we can show how it is. Now, in my book, I uh, go through a list of words. Now, that first rule there says that we are supposed to look at define rules. Uh, excuse me. Define the rules, yes, and define words. Now, what I have here is basically eight, eight words. And let me fix my formatting here. Hey, I didn't know it did this on me, but that's okay. It's a quick fix, right? Um, quick fix here, just momentarily. Here we go. There we go. And now we have it fixed, the formatting. It might be a little bit easier to read when I do this. Okay, so we want to look at these basic three, four, five, six, seven words that I guarantee are at the very base is the problematic for all. And the first we want to use and look at, and we're going to be doing this through uh, BibleHub.com. And we're going to be looking at the Greek words and we want you to explain uh, how this kind of program works right here. This is the most basic element 
elementary type. Now, what they do is they've got the Greek word metal. Uh, the, so the, it's listed by based on the Strong's Concordance, the number. So what they give you here is the meaning of the word, a word study help that it happens through uh, Thayer's and other places. Then through the NAS, NAS, it shows you the word origin, the definition, and, and things like this, if there is. And then they go to Thayer's Greek lexicon. Now, Greek's lexicon here, what they're going to do is show you the different ways that the word is used. Now, for instance, here, uh, the Greek word mellow is used basically two different ways. But under the second way, it's used in, in what, A, B, C, D, E, four different ways that it's used under that one. Now, let me show you here. So mellow uh, is to be is used to be on the point of doing without ever doing, to delay. It actually can idea of delay. So what they do in here is show where the word is used in that in secular authors, because let me go back to the rules real quick. Let me show you something here. Um, I think it is present, the rule of precedent. We must not violate the known uses of a word or invent another for which there is no precedent. Just as a judge chief occupation is to study previous cases, so we understand the previous words. So when we go to Thayer's here, he's showing you different places and different secular materials where that word is used and the way it's used, and including uh, in the Greek Septuagint for like here at list fourth. 4 Maccabees 623.91. That is where the word is used. You can look it up. Now, when we click on the link here, Acts 22.16, it will take us to that verse. And now, why delay you, Melos, having arisen, be baptized, and wash away the sins of you calling on the name of him? So what does this mean? So why would you be, he's asking, why are you delaying? Why would you delay? That's the simple question. Let's, having heard everything, now that you've repented, why don't we go ahead and get you baptized right here now? And of course, this is to uh, the op Ethio uh, Ethiopian that Philip uh, ministered to on the chariot. So here it's used as delay to get across the idea, why are you delaying? Now, what Thayer's also does is in general of what is, oops, let's go up there. Um, I want to deal with this first, of course. In general, what is sure to happen with an infinitive present? So with an infinitive future, like Acts 24, 15. We know it's all future, right? Present, infinitive, uh, some of those used, but the, when it's written with a present, uh, with a future infinitive. And what do I mean by that? Where's the word mellow? Right there, melanin. There is about to be. So that word there means I am, I exist. The first person single present indicative of a prolonged form of a primary defective verb, I exist. So what does that mean? To be, it is something that is to be created. So es uh, it means to be. So there is about to be, um, which means again then that there is sure to be in the future. Uh, resurrection of just, both the just and the adjust. So it's going to sure to be. It is never saying that there is about to be. And the reason is, see this, present infinitive means it's active. There is about to be. The idea that's coming across there is sure to be. In the future, infinitive middle. Sometime in the future, we don't know when, but there is going to be. There is about to be. And that is what is conveyed in the, in the, uh, in the verse. And that, so that is how Thayer's works. It shows those verses in the general sense that which it's used. So it lists these verses to talk about as something that is sure to happen. Now, also, uh, Greek writes from Homer down of things which will come to pass by fixed necessity or divine appointment. There's a subtlety difference of there that something that is going to happen, God is saying is going to happen in the future, and it's going to happen because God in is making it happen versus something man is going to do. So B up here lists things, of course, of that where man um, is saying it's going to happen or it's going to be. Uh, I can pull out here, say John 12, 4. Say, however, Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples of him, being about him to betray, was about. So yes, that was near in time, and Judas was about to betray him. 
And we know from the story that it did happen very quickly or soon after this discussion. So mellow, though, then can mean about to in time, something that is about ready to happen, but also something that it is strictly, uh, strictly speaking about something that is sure to happen. So here is our problem then is it is Thayer's and the Greek lexicons who are able to bring out these subtleties and, and does that. Now, what the uh, Full Predators does with no Greek training whatsoever, no experience in the language, will sit there and say that, no, theirs is wrong. It should have mean about what is to happen. And let me show you in the translations where this comes out. I'll go back to that, uh, that one passage, Acts 24, 15, and I'll show you. This is in general of what is sure to happen and should how be in, interpreted. A hope having in God, which also they themselves await that resurrection, there is about to be of the just, both in the unjust. Now, how do the different people, that is the literal Greek interpretation, right? How do they translate it? I have the same hope in God, these men, that there will be, that he will raise, that there will be, that there will be. Uh, see, those have no indication of time whatsoever, that it's about ready to happen right in close proximity of time. Um, and now Berean literal means it, it took the word literally and put it in there. So there is about to. So you find that. Um, and that there certainly sh shall certainly be. King James, that there will be. Doesn't say about to be, but there is to be. See, about to be, um, for example... When Judas portrayed Jesus about to, well, that happened within uh, a very short amount of time. Anytime that something is about to, uh, Paul was about to get on the ship. That means it happened in a very short time. About to never ever means that something that's written or something that's about to happen, like in the book of Acts when it's talking about it, or in the other epistles about to happen, does it ever mean that it is 20, 10, 15 years later? Uh, that is all future ideas of something that is sure to happen. When I say I'm about to load the boat, then that means I'm right now presently right there by the boat. And I'm getting ready to load it. Or I'm ready to get into it. I'm about to, I'm about to, whatever it might be. And it means that close in time, I'm about ready to do that thing because it's pertinent to the narrative and the story of what's going on versus I, I am sure when I'm talking to people that I'm sure that there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I'm not speaking to about to when it's going to be. I'm trying to get across to the people that there will be a resurrection of the just and the just. Yes, it is future, but there is going to be. And that's the distinction that uh, predators refuse and, and, and reject on, on every level. Now, that is the word mellow. Let's go to epiphania. Um, this is, this is another one. It is terribly butchered by, uh, predators and they refuse to look at it. Now I can find it, uh, because it's translated off and it's coming, um, at the appearance. It's the most common way that it's. I got to spell the word right. That would help. Um, come on. There. Second one is through eight. It's the most common one. And I'm using that because it also uses the word parousia in it. So how do we define these two words? Let's look at the Greek. Um, and I'll finish with these two words. And of course, we'll go on in the next videos. And we'll talk about the next few words in the next video. I do not want this to take on forever, of course. So, using an interlinear. Here we go. Uh, by the appearing of the coming. Okay, we're going to look at these two words together. Now, epiphania means appearance. The appearance, the manifestation, the glorious display. Uh, it comes from the word 5316, phano, to show forth. Now, this is the noun form, as you can see. Now, this is the verb form of the word, phano, to appear. Act, shine, shed light, pass, I shine, become visible, appear, 
I become clear, appear, seem to show myself. It's used in all of those ways. Now that is the verb. So the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Did he see it in a dream? Yes, that's something that they saw. The star appeared. Did the star appear in the east when they, Matthew? Yes. Then the Lord appeared to Joseph. Um, how can we go on there? You see all the verses that it's listed in. And it's 31 times. Uh, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while. while. So like smoke or vapor from off steam that comes up. It appears for a little while, then it dissipates. Uh, was not made out of things which are visible, things which do appear, appearing. So he's talking about creation, I believe, in that verse. Uh, when you appear as lights or you shine as lights, may appear approved. We should appear approved. Everywhere it is something that's being physically seen, something was shining, a uh, burning in a shining light. Uh, it, it's being seen. Now that is the verb. So where are the different ways? To shine or shed light, uh, to bring bright or resplendent, to become evident, to be brought forth. Uh, to meet the eye, strike the sight, become clear or manifest, to appear to the mind, seem to one's judgment or opinion. So something can come to mind in your own mind. Now, the word, though, that we're looking at is the noun form of the word. So if it generally means something is to appear, that epiphania is a technical term, uh, which intensified with that, it must properly, a fitting manifestation, literally an epiphany. It's the root of English word epiphany, right? So it literally suggests an appearing that builds on uh, the character of a particular situation and it emphasizes the fitting impact of Christ's visible appearance will have on the entire world. All will see it, saved and unsaved. And now, people can call that bias, but when we go to look at the, uh, the words there, uh, Tertullian, how it's used, uh, it's a glorious appearing of the manifestations of God's spectrum of their advent to help in Mac Second Maccabees, for example, it signals the deeds and that betoken the presence and power of God as a helper. And that means there was an army that became visible. That was the visible manifestation of Jesus coming, or excuse me, of God coming in judgment. He used them as the, the expression of him coming. Um, in the New Testament, of course, the advent of Christ. Uh, everywhere it, it's used, and there it's used six times, and only six times in scriptures. Um, as a noun, I have to make that very clear. So, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That's the first verse that we showed you there. First Timothy 6, 6, 4, until the appearing, by the appearing, uh, his appearing. Now, what do I mean by using as a noun? Okay, a verb, um, the running man, uh, running is a verb. But if I use it in the title of a book, like the running man or the running refrigerator, um, I'm not talking about the little refrigerator's running. I'm talking about it's running, you know, power-wise and all that, of course. But the idea, it's being used in a title. The appearing of John Cryer. The appearing of President Bush. He's going to show up. He's been absent. He's not here. But he's going to appear. This is the appearing of, of somebody or something. And that's how it's always used. Um... The manifestation then is something that is coming uh, six times as a noun, as a title. So Jesus, when he comes, we call that the appearing. And we also call it the coming. Because let's go back to that word, by the appearing of the coming. So this is an, not an, an a force. There is a, a, on both of them, we have te and tes. We both have the definical R with them. So the appearing and the a coming. So parousia then is also, see, uses a noun. And it means what? A presence, a coming of rival advent, especially of the second coming of Christ. So it's a technical term with a reference to the visit of a king or some other official of a royal visit. Now, it's used, they're used it two ways. Presence one, opposed to Philippians and all that. Uh, the presence of Home Kent's the coming arrival uh, of an advent. Now, I do disagree with some of this, um, like 2430, the way he used it. It's uh, 
here's the bias. They're saying that the coming arrival the advent of Jesus in Matthew 24, 30 is the presence of coming. It's talking about, and it's often talking that way, but N.T. Wright and many others are disagreeing with that and changing that and arguing that uh, the first coming of Christ is not to be a visible manifestation display as described in Matthew 24, 30. According to the Old Testament, the coming, and if we looked at something, I'm going to show you uh, I can do that. Let me pull it up real quick if it'll get there. Matthew 24, 3. It's not being used as a noun, I do not think. Let's look at this. The signs of your coming. Your coming. It doesn't say the coming, but of your, his coming. And so we're not talking about the coming of the Lord as in a second coming. We are talking about his coming in judgment where he sits at the right hand of the Father and sends judgment. So parousia used how many ways? 24 times. Now we can bring up, see these are, the, these are the forms of the word. It is a noun, so it's going to be either plural, singular, feminine, or plural, singular, neutral, and uh, how it's coming. So the coming, the coming. Now let me show you something. Forward hastening, the coming of the day. That's talking about Christ, right? Uh, the promise of his coming, that again is Christ. To you, the power and coming of our Lord. Again, future of Christ. Your hearts for the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Uh, second thing, the coming is in accord. Uh, by the appearance of his coming, Second Timothy 8, which is the one we've been dealing with. Regard to the coming of the Lord. At the coming of our Lord. Uh, until the coming of the Lord. At the coming, at his coming, by his coming, used by the coming of, what? Whoa, wait, what? What did that say? Titus. By the coming of Titus. Now, is this coming? Data of feminine singular, data of feminine singular. Okay, so we have the coming, the parousia of Titus. We have the parousia of Stephanos. Uh, Christ coming again. The coming of the, and then we go into Matthew. So will be the, the coming of the Son of Man. So we're talking about, it's only used in Matthew. It is in an Old Testament reference, of course, to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. It has nothing to do with about the second coming. Because the second coming, here's the difference. And this is something that Don Preston argues, is that this Old Testament coming is where he sits at the right of that father, and it is judgment that comes, and that's what they see is the coming of that. The distinction between the two comings, the first one is not actually a coming of Jesus himself down, but an army that comes in his place. It is in Acts 1. Let's go to the thing there. Here is the difference. It says what? Men of Jew Galilee, why do you stand looking at him? This Jesus, not clouds, not chariots, not angels, but this Jesus who was taken up from you. So what was taken up from him was Jesus into heaven. Will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So it'll be Jesus who comes back down out of heaven. Uh, what do we get a picture of this? Apocalyptic language, we still get the same thing, don't we? Here we go. Then I saw the heavens open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on, on it is called Faithful and True and Righteous, and he judges and makes war. So the heavens are opened. He comes down out of heaven. That is this description that is used over and over again. Um, when we go to here, behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. There's several verses in it. I will not go through that right. Uh, take too long. But behold, he is coming with the clouds. Uh, did he come with the clouds? In with the clouds? Yes. So out of the clouds, he is coming. That is all that it is saying. It has nothing to do with physical, bodily, or anything else. That has nothing to do with it. But as we said, we go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. One more thing to point out. So these are the titles of his coming. What does it say? And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will what? Overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor, splendor, 
they buy the appearance, the appearance of the coming, uh, of his coming. So when we used it with Tep Titus, Stephanus, when they came, it was a coming and it is a appearing when he comes. Uh, that is what we are arguing for. That is what we hold to. And so when we talk about the meaning of these words, okay, come on, be nice to me here. That's my daughter. Let's see. Come on. All of a sudden it's not being nice. There it is. All right. Mellow. Let's apply me. What is sure to come? What is about to come? Epiphany appearing. So full pressure to deny he will appear at his second coming uh, to be made visible, to manifest. It is something is to be bright. It means you can be. It's translated one way is brightness, but something is not bright if you cannot see it. A bright light like what on the mountain of transfiguration. Christ was there, physical, and it was a very bright display that they saw, but they saw his physical body change right in front of their eyes. The parousia, the coming, the presence, a physical presence after being absent. So God comes to judgment in clouds in Matthew. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the royal visit of a king who comes after being absent. So that is where we're getting the idea. That is what the, the church has held on to for all these years. The meaning and the way those two words are used. Um, in no sense are we talking about God coming in a judgment um, on clouds uh, as a form of his second coming, because he said his second coming is Jesus himself who descends, who comes out of heaven with an army. Uh, Revelation 19, 2 Thessalonians 3, 15, I believe it is also. It says he will come with him. In Zechariah 14, uh, 5, he will come with his saints. All of the scriptures talks about him coming with the saints. So in any kind of debate that John wants to go to, we're going to be looking at those definitions, those, those words, looking at those meanings, and deal with them. So in our next video, we're going to tackle tacky, somaticos, agizo, doxa, and pneumaticos as the other three, four, five basic words that prayers mess up on a regular basis. So now, let me see if I do this right. Okay, we're back to the big screen again. Am I sh closing it? Am I right? No. Let's try this again. There it is. Hi, folks. Welcome to... Let's get this out of the way. All right, so I'm learning how to play with all of that. All right, thank you guys for sticking around and listening. And, uh, of course, this is all in preparation for uh, John Watson, who wants to bait, uh, William Bell, anybody. I, I would... Let's go for it, man. Let's go for it. Um, how long do I have to chase you? How many videos do I need to make that uh, chases you around to get it to do it? But uh, this is just basics, people. Rules of hermeneutics. Um, in our next one, we're going to go a little bit more into the other rules here, and we'll take a look at those and explain them a little bit more. Okay, so thank you guys for watching and sticking around. You guys have a good night, and we'll talk to you later on the flip side.